Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Stuart. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. There's a lot of open seats in the front, so the people that have said they were new, please come up and have a seat and join Alcoholics Anonymous, because that's what I had to do. You know, I was uh, introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous in 1984 uh, by way of the family, you know, and I sat in a meeting like this with a wristband on, and people had 39 years, 20 years, 10 years, 5 years. And I said, these people need to get a life. I got it made, but yet I'm living at McDonald's Center. (laughs) But they need to get a life. And uh, I found out 30 years later, when I got sober at 48, that they had the life all along, and I realized I wanted that life. And uh, to do that, I had to do a lot of things. You know, and I was willing to do what they suggested by sitting in the front, um, calling people and going through the whole, I was willing to take suggestions. So that's, that's now, and we'll come back to that. You know, my alcoholic mind is, is so crazy that I pulled up tonight and I parked and I go, oh wow, I'm the main speaker. I'm going to go park in the main speaker parking spot. So I pulled up. You know, pulled out of one spot, pulled into that spot. I pulled into the 10-minute spot. <laughs> and I sat there for five minutes going, should I move my car to the 10-minute spot, to the, uh, to the main speaker spot? Conversation in my head. <laughs> but that's too noticeable. I don't want to be noticed. So I get out of the car and just move the signs. <laughs> okay? That, that's how I think. You know? And that's... So, you know, and literally, that's my craziness in my mind, you know. My sober date is August 3rd, 2007, and it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. You know, I, I grew up here in San Diego, born and raised. Um, went to school over here at Hardy Elementary by San Diego State. Um, typical family. Parents got divorced when I was in eighth grade in my family. I always was irritable, restless, irritable, and discontent from kindergarten. You know, I had to dress perfect because I didn't want anybody to make fun of me. And I didn't even know you, and I felt you had a better opinion of me than I had of myself. I don't even know you. So everything had to be perfect, and nothing was perfect. You know, they sent me off to get glasses because I couldn't read. And I didn't want to wear glasses because I would stand out. And all this stuff from wearing braces and all this, what people do, this is the way you should live and this is our suggestions. For me, I didn't want to live that way because I would stand out. You would make fun of me. And that all kind of went away in sixth grade. Well, even before that, when I used to dig into the parents' liquor cabinet, you know, and drink, um, shit, whatever they had in the liquor cabinet. <laughs> it didn't matter, you know, we, they had the big bottles of, um, Galileo, not Galileo wine, um, Galileo. something yeah. like that. <laughs> so, I, I, I drank cream de mint, man, because it tastes good. Yeah. You know, and, and, and listen. <laughs> A lot of Manischewitz in my life. Um, but what was so, it just made me comfortable. And I always hung out with those people, that gang. You know, I like to be, I, I fell to the stoner crowd. Because I wanted to be the other crowd. I didn't know how to be that crowd, so I made fun of those people. So it was easier for me to be a stoner. And in sixth grade, my brother had a keg party which was okay for my mom to give, have a keg party when he's 18 or 16. And they gave me pot. 
you know, and I was drinking beer at the same time. And, and when I found that, I was like, wow, this is good. This is cool. It made me cool. I found something that made me cool, that I didn't have to be myself. And that went on through sixth grade. I was one of the, the party kids like everybody else was. We went and stood in front of 7-Eleven that I go to in now and buy cases of beer. You know, you're, you're in seventh grade and you're standing in front of 7-Eleven and you're going to buy, can I, hey, buy us two cases of beer. It's not like one case or a six pack. We have two cases of beer. And we would do that. We would go in the canyon and drink. But the difference for me back then is they all went home. And bless you. They went home and I wasn't ready to go home yet. I found other things to make me drink more. And they went, they, all these other kids went home and said, what about me? You know, I want you guys to stay and drink. So they didn't. They went home, and I went through that all the way through school. You know, I was that party atmosphere. And I didn't think anything was wrong with it. You know, my, my brother drank and smoked pot in the house. You know, I found out growing up, after I got sober and I did a fourth step, that we were that house on the street. And I never wanted to be that house, you know, where, where the, the keg parties were, the pot smokers were, the cars. That's low-life shit. That's not my house. But after working the steps, that was my house. And I wasn't proud of that, you know. Um, but I'm glad it was my house. <laughs> You know, that was, I came from, you know, I came from the, the philosophy of a parent that, you know, as long as I'm not doing it in the canyon, it's safe at the house. So I had a license to smoke pot and drink in the house at eighth and ninth grade. You know, and uh, today, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't have any kids, man, but that's not going to happen in my house. You know, it's just not. So I, I just went through school that whole way of being not able to read, being in the stoners, and, and just hanging out and having a good time. And as I went through school, I still felt irritable, restless, and discontent. My mom got me a beautiful jacket, but it was the wrong freaking jacket because I, they would make fun of me because it wasn't one of the big, fluffy down jackets that we used to wear back in the early 70s. You know? Um <laughs> Here's something funny. We're, I think I was in eighth grade, and, and I had booze in one pocket and pot in the other pocket. And all her friends are around the house, and she shows her friends what she got me for Christmas. And she pulls the jacket out of my closet and puts it on and puts the hand in the pocket and pulls out a bag of pot in front of all her friends. And says, oh, and I'm sitting there going, oh, man, I'm in trouble. But I got in trouble, and I went on. It was no, it's like I never suffered consequences for my actions and, until later on in life. You know, so I just went through school and I existed. You know, all I did was exist. And as I went through school, I went into continuation school. I went to Garfield Continuation School, you know, here in San Diego. And uh, it was a great school because all the big bad guys never showed up. Till the following year, and then I got out of school. But at that time, all my friends, what few friends I had, because I always stayed by myself, was they got married. You know, they, they met someone, they went to service, they all got married and got their lives. I kept doing what I was doing. You know, I went to work for my parents at, at their store, and I found... You know, I tried to give suggestions. Let's try this. And my parents said, no, you just do what you do. We'll take care of everything here. And at that point, it gave me a license to be a pe to do nothing and sponge off of them. And I did that for 20 years. On and off with a lot of, you know, we call them dry goods. I did a lot of cocaine. You know, it was, that's what we did. And uh, with that was drinking all the way through. You know, um, I got married in 1984 and uh, to a beautiful woman. 
who I thought was just, it was all outside stuff. So I was married in 84. Rehab, April of 85. I mean, what's next? Empty condo, August of 85. And that was my trip being married. You know? And I love how it talks about, I just read Doctor's Opinion in the Men's Step Study, and I love that, that, uh, that part of the book. Because I'm it. You know, and I love where it talks about in the book, it'll say, well, why doesn't he stop for her? And, and why does he drink that she could, you know, she'd be such a good wife and everything. I had so many conversations with my parents and friends, you know, knee to knee. All you got to do is stop. All I had to do was to stop drinking and using. And I could have whatever I wanted. So I thought. Or they wanted me to do it. I couldn't do that. Why can't he stop for her? She's so nice. Why can't he stop? He has such a great job. And I tried to stop. I, you know, there were times, you know, when I went to rehab in 84, you know, I wanted to stop. And after the first week, I started feeling better. And I started getting a little healthier. And, and I got out and I went back to work for my parents. And I walked into the store, and nobody changed. They were all assholes. <laughs> okay? All of them. And now I know today it's I'm the one that's supposed to change. You're going to be a jerk. They're going to be a jerk. It's all about what I'm supposed to do with me. They're not going to, you know. If everybody were to change for me, I wouldn't be an alcoholic. That doesn't happen. You know, they're not going to change for me. They're going to 86 me. They're going to throw me out, and I'm going to be destitute, which I was. And I built it all back up, and I lost it, and I built it all back up, and I lost it because of alcohol. You know, I always wanted what you guys had, and I didn't know how to get there. You know, in 1990, I went to a fellowship, and... uh trying to get sober, having conversations with, with a friend of mine who's very important in my life, going, why can't you stop using Taking me to another rehab at Mena Vista, Mesa Vista, doing another outpatient program, always running back to rehabs, you know, and, and it just never worked. But in 1990, I went to, uh, I didn't go to rehab, I went to the Narcotics Anonymous. I stopped using and I went, all I did was go camping. You know, there was 10 of us, and all I did was collect state disability. All 10 of us, and all we did was go camping. I didn't work any steps. I was being a teenager at the age of 30. And guaranteed, as it says in the book, if I don't have a spiritual program behind me, eventually I will drink. And, and I was at a hotel with a friend of mine, and it was great. We were... She was drinking and wine, and I looked, and I go, you know, I think I could do this. And I had wine. And it's kind of like it says in the book, what happens next? A trip, once more, a trip to the sanitarium. But I didn't have a sanitarium. I, I was in my own craziness for, for 10 years after that. But I never picked up the drugs after that. It was all about alcohol. And I was periodic, you know, but I always had to be perfect because I didn't want to feel bad. I wanted everybody to like me, you know. And there was a point in my life where, you know, I, I got fired finally for the, I got fired, got back to work. Then they sold the family business, and I was pissed off because they didn't give it to me. For 20 years, they were telling me one day this was going to be yours, you know, and they didn't give it to me. And all that time, I like how it's talks in the book, you know, when, when Bill talks in his story that during the Depression, everybody, you know, jumped out of buildings. They, he called them cowards. What did he do? He went to the bar. Every Because that's what he knew. Every time I went, something bad happened to my life, I didn't straighten out my life. I knew what would straighten it out. I would go to the bar. And I would stuff it down because that's the only thing that I knew how to do. 
and I did it my whole life. You know, that ease, you know, we drink for the effect of alcohol that it gives us. It wasn't for getting loaded, I found out. It was for the ease and comfort that it gave me. You know, I love someone says, you know, I love what alcohol, you know, does for me. Not to me, what it does for me. It gives me that comfortableness. But unfortunately, I keep waking up in the morning and I'm back where I am. And it pisses me off. So what do I do? I, I drink some more. You know, and I've done it for a long, long time. And so after the two years of being clean and sober, I drank. And I just ran my life. I opened a business. I, I, I went to meetings now and then, you know. And before that, I was hanging out up in L.A. And I was hanging out in meetings on weekends. But I still was drinking during the week. But AA was always there. And coming back in 97, you know, I was still drinking on and off. I opened my business, and, and I was just a periodic. It set idle until 2000. In 2000, I had rotator cuff surgery, and they gave me Vicodins. And it's like, okay, I'm awake now. You know, and with the Vicodins and the alcohol, I have arrived. You know, the sedatives were working. And they were working real good. They were working real good that I'm grateful that I had people working in my store after we opened it that knew what they were doing. <laughs> Otherwise, I would be, I don't know what. I wouldn't be where I am, I think. I'd be wherever God wanted me to be, you know. But they did the hard work, you know. They they kept it together, and uh, I didn't do much. But that, with that stuff in the booze, just, I was comfortable. I didn't have to interact with anybody. I could stay home on the weekends. I could be a loner, you know, and, and I loved it. And I still love being a loner and sitting at home by myself, moping, going, oh, fuck, no one loves me, da, 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 da. You know, I got a group of friends here that are tonight that, that I love. What's nice is they love me too. And I know that. You know, I, have, I drove cross country being sober in a fiberglass doom buggy, you know, because we thought it would be a good idea with another club, with a club that I belong to. You know, and so everything that's happening to me now in life, I know what you guys had that had the 20 years. There's a freedom, there's an ease and comfort that comes from working the steps. You know, in, in 2007, I came to an AA meeting in La Mesa behind Helix High called Monday Night Live, and I heard the promises. And I go, that's what I want. But I drank a couple times after that. Then I came back to that meeting, and I heard the promises, and I went to some men in the rooms, and I said, how do I do this? And they said, stick with us. And at 90 days, they had me on my first AA camp out. You know, and they, they stood across the campground. I love this story. I pulled up in a motorhome, you know, piece of shit, Alcoholics Anonymous motorhome, if you had one, you know, that nothing worked in it. You know, but it got me there. They stood on the other side of the campground and watched me go in and out of this motorhome for 10 minutes, 20 minutes because I didn't know what to do with myself. Finally, they came over and got me and says, come with us. And Alcoholics Anonymous just did that for me. They said, come with us. Don't sit in the back. Move up to the front, and we'll show you how to stay sober. But I had the willingness to do whatever they wanted me to do. You know, if I didn't want to stay sober, you they couldn't have told me anything. You know, if I wanted to stay sober at McDonald's Center in 1984, I would have done what they suggested. But I didn't want to stay sober. And when I was ready, the teachers came. And boy, they're good teachers. You know, everybody in this room that, that sponsors people, that are working the steps, will stay sober. 
because there's, a, there's something in these rooms that happened that at one point in our li- in my life, and the men I know and women I know in life, we've all been in a ball, crawled up in the middle of a living room, crying, I cannot do this anymore. Okay, there's no different from me doing it in my room, in my house, to the person laying behind the freaking dumpster doing it. It, It's a gift of desperation. We all want the same thing. Circumstances might be different, but the feeling is the same. The feeling of that turning this in your gut that wants to make you puke because you can't do this anymore. And you go to a meeting, and you say, I'm ready to do this. And you start feeling better. I started feeling better. And once I started feeling better, the one thing I wanted made me go out and drink again. Because I started feeling better. And once I realized, once I started feeling better, I had to, that's when I had to start really getting help. And by doing that, I started working the steps. You know, everybody said the steps on the wall, the steps on the wall. And I know I admitted that I'm powerless over alcohol. My life is unmanageable. You know, we admit it. You know, I I like reading the book sometimes in in, in I statements. I'm selfish and self-centered. I'm not going to admit nothing. You know, I got caught smoking pot and drinking behind a bank on Oklahoma Boulevard, and the cops in eighth grade, the cops pointed to everybody, and everybody said, you know, you smoking pot and drinking? Yes, yes, yes. They turned to me, they go, are you? And I said, no. So one out of ten, and they said, okay, you're the one we're taking home. Because I refused. I don't, I don't know why, I just refused. You know, I don't want to get caught. I want to lie. And, and I don't like that about myself. You know, because I still have that character defect. And now that character defects, when I started with that, it would come in six and seven. I would just say something that would, like, screw everything up. It's like, oh, shit, why did I say that? And then, (laughs) the stuff left. And then, I would, before I say it, I would go, you know, maybe I shouldn't say this. And I'd still say it. (laughs) But I'm thinking, maybe I shouldn't say it. And now, maybe I shouldn't say this. And sometimes... I don't say it. (laughs) And the times I don't say it, things seem to work out pretty good, but there's still times I say that shit. (laughs) But I recognize that. And and to be sober and recognize your change, the change in me, was fantastic. I called my sponsor. Hey, this is what happened. You know, I remember reading the book. I learned how to read, reading the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. With an eighth grade reading level and dyslexic and, and all this other stuff, they gave me a book in 1984 and everybody signed it, you know, hey, stay sober and yeah, all this beautiful crap. You know, and you get home and the book goes on a shelf and that's it. I still have that book and I read out of that book sometimes with my sponsee. I love it. Two of those people are sober now. In fact, there's a gentleman who, who was my first sponsor in 1984, just gave me a 10-year token that I saw in a meeting. And, and I cried when I saw that man. That stuff doesn't happen in a normal person's life. First of all, they're not an Alcoholics Anonymous, but they don't have a God in their life. You know? And, and I've learned that by, by coming to these rooms. There's something special. You know, so I'm powerless over alcohol. My life is unmanageable. My life has been unmanageable my whole life. I've just maintained. And, and Alcoholics Anonymous has helped me not have to maintain, helped me deal with that stuff. You know, I tried to get sober. I stopped for a while, but eventually I drank again, as it says. Number two, it says, we came to believe in the power of greater ourselves could restore us to sanity. I love how it says we came to believe. It doesn't say we came to believe right now. Over a period of time, there's a little bit of willingness that I think what they have here will help me. I was so desperate this last time that, you know, you said stand in the corner on your head. I'd say, you're freaking crazy, but I might go sit in the corner 
And then I would stand in the corner on my head. Um, today, they say, go stand in the corner. Had I been around a little bit, I say, you know, you come with me and do it. <laughs> and sure enough, my sponsor will say, okay, let's go do this. And I'll go do it. You know, and I made a decision to turn the will of my life over the care of God as I understand him. God, higher power, group of drunks. There is something in these rooms that's an aura. It's an energy that happens in these rooms. We're sober. We're not supposed to be sober. You know, lives are turned around in these rooms. Kids are brought back. So if you don't have a God, call it the group of drunks, the people in the rooms. And it says that in the book. I, you know, I got an idea for you, Bill. Why don't you find, why don't you use your own conception of God? You know, have your own conception of God. I could not fight, as Bill said in the book, I could not fight that anymore. He did not have an answer for that. And then he gets sober, you know. I don't have an answer for that. I see people, I see professors find God. College-educated people find God in these rooms. They find a higher power. And a lot of times it's just easier to say God. You know, I remember when in 1984, I said, oh, I'm, I'm Jewish, man. I'm not going to find a God. You know, you're talking about Jesus. You know, I haven't been to temple in 15 years, but nope, no, it's not going to happen to me. You know, so I said, oh, I'll find Moses. He'll be my God. You know, anything, any excuse not to do it. Today, I don't care. There's a God in my life because I wouldn't be standing here. You know, and, and they said, okay, now we do that. We made a decision to, to turn our will and our life over to the care of God. And then we step into action. So one, two, and three, I'm right with God. And I'm going to call him God. So I'm right with God. Step four. Oh, big step four. I was anxious to do step four because I wanted what you guys had. And I wrote all those little secrets down and I did the steps out of the book and we made the columns and I shared that with my sponsor. And I got to tell you, for the people that are new, if you haven't done a step four, the people that have been around here for, for five, ten years and you haven't done a step four, do it. Because when I came and walked into Alcoholics Anonymous after doing step four, and step five, with my sponsor, I was part of Alcoholics Anonymous. For the first time in my life, I did something for myself. I didn't cheat. I didn't steal. I didn't lie. And my whole life was lying, cheating, and stealing. How can I pass this test? I'm going to go find the answers. You know, that was my whole life. I, I took scuba diving lessons, and I cheated on the test. <laughs> okay? You know, I found, a way to, I found a way to manipulate it that I could pass. Now, I never went scuba diving after that, but I thought it would be a good idea. <laughs> but that that's, was my life, and I never did anything in Alcoholics Anonymous half-ass because I don't want to drink again. You know, and I shared that stuff with the sponsor. And I wrote that stuff down. And it's no big deal. It's not this boogaboo, whatever the hell you want to call it. You know, you, you, you make the columns, you go down one, two, and three, and you share it. It's no big deal. It doesn't say we have to be perfect. You know, it doesn't say that. It says a searching for a fearless moral. There's some immoral stuff in there, of course. <laughs> some real bad stuff. You know, I found myself in bad situations that I don't ever want to be in again. And I have no problem sharing that with my sponsor and my sponsees. <laughs> you know, but we all have done it. We've all done bad shit just as we've all been in a ball in the middle of the living room going, I can't do this anymore. And I love six and seven they call are, are the forgotten steps. You know, we're, ready, we're entirely ready to have God remove these defects of character. Um, what the hell's a defect of character? I didn't know until I came to these rooms. My defect of character was opening my mouth. <laughs> now my, de now, you know, and, and then it says, 
hum- then to humbly ask him to remove those shortcomings. Okay? So now I ask him to remove that, and I think about before what I say. It's as simple as I could be for me. You know, so what I like about it is those are hard steps because that's my core. That's my personality. I don't want you to take away my shyness. I don't want you to take away my rudeness. You know, I always wanted to be, I hated snobs, but I always wanted to be a snob. You know, and then someone told me, you know, you're a snob. I'm going, no, I'm not. And they go, and they pointed out there's situations in my life where I've been that way. You know, so I work on that stuff. So, you know, I like it, and I made my amends. You know, I, I, I made a list, which I had before, and I went to my list of people I had harmed, and I made my amends. I went to my father. I went to people I love, um, close people, and I went to everybody on that list. You know, I remember going to my dad after, what, it was a year and a half, and I finally was ready to make that amends. And I sat down and said, Dad, i got to talk to you. And I stole a lot of money. From, I stole a lot of stuff from this man. A lot of stuff. And he knew it. You know, he, he paid for my first rehab when they were $10,000 back in 1984. And, and I never knew that till later on. And, and I went and saw him, and I said, i got to talk to you. And he goes, what the F now? You know, I says, you know, I'm sober now. I need to make these amends. And, and I know I, I treated you bad. I disrespected you. You know, I wanted more from you, but you couldn't give me any more. And I want to make it right. You know, I go, I took from you. And I stole from you. And I asked my sponsor, I go, well, do I tell him how much I stole? And he goes, nah, we call that leading with your chin. But <laughs> if he brings it up, if he brought it up, said, well, how much did you take? I was willing to tell him. And I was willing to pay him back. And he said, I know you took from me. And I know you stole from me. Just keep doing what you're doing. And, and, and I shut, I shut it up. I shut up after that. <laughs> okay? Because I like to keep talking, but you don't understand. You know, Stuart, we understand. Shut up. <laughs> no, you don't understand. You know, I gotta go move the two signs in the parking lot so no one sees everything. I'm, I'm right. So I made those amends. I went to my grandfather's grave and made amends to him. One of the greatest men in the world. You know, when I was sober. When I was drinking, he was the biggest butt in the world, you know, but he was doing it out of love. Everything that I learned from, from you hearing the promises, I did because I was drinking. Now I'm doing living those things because I'm sober. You know, I love that stuff and the promises. You know, so I, I made my amends. I take personal inventory every day to the best of my ability. And I promptly admit it when I'm wrong to the best of my ability. And I do pretty good at that. I love meditation. I love prayer. Because I know there's a God. Because I went to a Joe and Charlie thing. I had a year sober. And and this doesn't happen. It only happens in Alcoholics Anonymous. That it was a day before I had a year. And I was talking to someone outside. And the next break, somebody walked up to me that I didn't even know and handed me a one-year token and says, I hear you're having a year birthday tomorrow. Here's your token. For someone that overheard a comment, that doesn't happen unless you're in Alcoholics Anonymous. So I took the token and gave it to a friend of mine and says, give this to me tomorrow. So he put it in a card, took it to Joe and Charlie up on stage, and they signed it to me, you know, and signed my book and stuff like this. And I didn't know this happened. And that never happened to me before. So as long as those little miracles keep happening with me, I'm staying. Even when they stop, 
I'm staying because I don't want to drink anymore. You know, I, I thought through prayer and meditation. I love prayer and meditation. I was turned on to a nap on a phone. You know, come after the meeting, I'll tell you what it is. And I listen to meditation in the mornings. And I love it. And I pray. I don't pray as much as I should during the day. Sometimes I get up in the morning after praying and go to work and start work. And I forget what I read in the morning. But somebody calls me during the day and we talk. Or I call somebody. I call them AA phone calls. Pick up the phone and say hello. Because you never know. That person might be having a bad day. And you just might save someone's life. You should. You just might give them have a good day. You know, because normal people don't do that. And now I carry the message. Uh, I had a spiritual awakening because I'm standing up here. Nervous as shit. Ten minutes. Thank you. I'm on my last quarter. I get four tens here. I had it all figured out. And uh, <laughs> so now we'll move into what do we move? Anyway, spiritual awakening, you know. As a result of taking these steps, you have to take the steps. It's a design for living. And after I did step five and came to an Alcoholics Anonymous, I was part of you. I was part of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, it's a great, great thing. And now I carry the message. I had some sponsees. Some are sober, some are not. Uh, I just celebrated 10 years for, for a liar like me. You know, who, who took dirty tokens when he first came around these rooms. If you don't know what those are, I was still using and taking 30, 60, 90 day tokens. And the greatest thing for me is I stood up and took a 30 day token and I had not had a drug or a drink in my body. For the first time in my life, I didn't lie. I took a year sober, first time in my life. Two, three. Shit, now I got, you know, I got 10. Where the hell did the time go? You know, but it's a hell of a lot different now than it was a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. I've done other men's work. I've done a lot of things. And there's more to go because I have people in recovery that have more time than I do. And I see what they go through. So I get to wait for this stuff. You know, God says, as it says in the book, well, we grow through pain. I hate pain. I've been through that in the last three years. I don't like it, but it's going to happen again. And as long as I'm ready, my sponsor is going to say to me, well, now you can take your experience that you've learned here and you can carry it to this person over here. Oh, that was, I hate it. I don't want to hear that. But I understand that. So um, I love to be sober. There is a God. He's in this room. And for the people that are new, come from the back sit in the front. People that are sober that want to carry the message will do everything their hearts can do to keep you sober. But if you don't want it, we have to move on to the person that wants it. And it says it in the book. We have to move on to the person that wants it. Because trying to help somebody that doesn't want it, we might pass up the opportunity to help the person that wants it. And if I could do it, anybody could do it. I mean, that's just what it is. And everybody's sweating, so I'm just going to sit here and stand here and let you sweat a little more. <laughs> you know, this guy's he's melting <laughs> a little bit. So I'm grateful and honored to be here, to be sober. The steps are our way of living. One, two, and three, I'm right with God. Four, five, six, and seven. Uh, I'm right with myself. Eight, nine, and ten, and the rest, I'm right with humanity. And I could not do any of the steps till I was right with God. And then everything else flows. Don't go, I couldn't go make my amends when I first came in here like I wanted to. All I do was saying I'm sorry again. And today when I say I'm sorry, people that know me say, well, that worked when you had 30 days. Don't do it anymore. And I'm trying my best, and I'm honored to uh, to be here. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.